Thank you so much for coming tonight and spending your Friday afternoon. I am Melissa Crawford. I'm the director of the Scheinfeld Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation here at Santa Barbara City College. And I just wanted to share with you for a moment how excited we are to have this entrepreneurship program on campus. And we now have 188 students enrolled in entrepreneurship courses this semester. So that's a record for us. Thank you. Uh, I have just a couple of uh, initial announcements to make. We have uh, our first annual Scheinfeld Center New Venture Challenge coming up in spring, Friday the 13th. <laughs> and so we're very excited to be hosting our first business plan competition that's going to include high school students. We're very excited to have the high school students coming on campus. Um, they, they won't compete against the college students, but there will be uh, opportunities for them to compete amongst themselves. And then um, we'll have cash prizes, we have grants, scholarships, and um, we're just excited to welcome our budding entrepreneur community um, to compete. And we have uh, NABO, the National Association for Women and Business, Women Business Owners Santa Barbara Chapter helping to sponsor that event, so we're very excited to have them involved. Um, and we want to make a special thank you to Elna Scheinfeld, wife of the late Jim Scheinfeld. Here's Jim at work. And without their generosity, none of this would be possible. So I'd like to have a round of applause for Elna, who's here tonight. I'm not sure if any of our board members are here, but we have an advisory board, and um, if any of our board are here, we, we thank you for your support. So is anybody here? Michael Berkowitz, Chris Morales, anybody? Yes, okay, thank you for coming. Let's, let's hear it for our board members. Also tonight, the Center for Sustainability is a partner with us, and we thank them for helping us to promote this event. So um, we, we have been developing a relationship with the Center for Sustainability, and we're looking forward to future events um, and collaboration with them. So we have a wonderful evening planned for you tonight. Um, one of our favorite lecturers and chair of the Business Administration Department, Bonnie Chavez, is moderating tonight. He's been a great supporter of the Scheinfeld Center, and without him, we wouldn't have any entrepreneurship courses. And he does an amazing job of extracting stories. And he's, he's going to ensure an interesting journey tonight. So thank you, Bonnie. Mr. Orfila is widely renowned for his entrepreneurial success, growing a single copy shop into a $2 billion a year industry with 1,700 branches worldwide and more than 22,000 co-workers. Much of Kinko's success can be traced directly to Orfila's upbringing and unique business philosophy based on his free thinking and creative style. <laughs> his theories and instincts on how to operate a successful business are grounded in a passion for retailing taking care of his co-workers and customers and a sharp eye for opportunity. In 2005, Mr. Orfila wrote, copy this, lessons from a hyperactive dyslexic who turned a bright idea into one of America's best companies. This is the book that is for sale outside. This unique autobiography is filled with life lessons on overcoming obstacles and turning impediments into opportunities. He succeeded using learning differences and unorthodox approach to business to mold a compassionate, unconventional, partner-driven culture that allowed Kinko's to thrive and made it, according to Fortune and Forbes, one of the best places to work in America. Please join me in welcoming Paul Orfla. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you again for coming. This is really an exciting event, and it marks a real uh, benchmark in terms of our opportunity to bring out uh, amazing individuals and human beings and business people to share their story with you, share some important insights, and hopefully you'll all walk away tonight, as I think I know you will, inspired and impressed by an amazing man, Paul Orfila. Uh, I have developed a series of questions, and in about 30, 40 minutes, somewhere in that vicinity, if you've got a question you'd like to ask Mr. Orfila, 
There are mics at each side of the room, and we would ask you to begin lining up so we can give you an opportunity to ask Paul anything that might be in your head that you would like to have him answer for you tonight. So welcome again, Paul, and let's see if we can't get started. Well, as Melissa mentioned, you have written an amazing book. I've been reading it, and it's one of the best books on business I've read in a long time. And um, I was touched by a lot of things that you say in the book, but I was especially touched by your feelings and relationship with your mother. And when we met a week ago, you said something that was really profound that I went home and shared with my kids right away that your mother shared with you. And I was wondering, would you be kind enough to explain to the audience tonight what your mom said about what you do in your 20s and in your oh, 30s? Oh. You know how gra gravity is? A baby goes like this and drops and then picks it up. Drops, drops, drops. So a ch a people, my mother said in your 20s, try everything. In your 30s, figure out what you do best. In your 40s, make money from what you do best. In your 50s, just don't do too much. <laughs> and uh, I had these two uncles I really admired. And they had saved their money. They were bartenders. They lived in my grandmother's house, saved money. Then they bought the bar. Then they s bought real estate. And it, by the time they were 50, their biggest decision every day was, where am I going to go eat lunch? And so I always figured, you know, that would be a tough way to wake up, Italian. So uh, <laughs> I followed my mother's advice, and I experimented, and I figured out the place I was Kinko's was a place in my 40s I did okay with. Excellent. <laughs> so we should be encouraging our students who are in their 20s to go out there and experience all they can. Well, I think that's the problem is you guys aren't, you guys are seduced by good grades and uh, getting uh, accolades from other people. So I'm not quite sure that you, I don't know nowadays if rejection is part of your everyday life. So I think a lot of business and doing things is just the idea of having resilience. I'm going to ask you all a question. If your little five-year-old comes to you with a painting from school, what are you going to say? Good. Absolutely the worst thing you can say. Because what you do by saying good job is you teach a child to please others rather than please themselves. What you might want to say is, tell me about the painting and why did you do it? But I think we're producing, I don't know if today people are risk takers. They want a lot of attaboys. You have to get it from within sooner or later. So I'm not sure. Can I amplify it a little bit? Absolutely, please. Here I am. I'm at USC, and it's really not complicated. I saw these people in line, Xeroxing. What a discovery. If they're Xeroxing at USC, why wouldn't they Xerox at Santa Barbara? Was this oh, such research? I didn't invent the Xerox machine. They were just in line, Xeroxing. And it, at one point, I mean, all the customers could see, I had all the customers in line. My own workers could see how much money I was taking in. And I was in every, we expanded every college in America. And what always baffled me is why I didn't have more people across the street competing with me. And uh, I think even back then you weren't risk takers, we were risk takers, but look back on your grandparents. If your grandparents had seen that I had something good with customers in line, do you think they would have been out there competing with me in a heartbeat? So uh, I'm not sure risk taking is as rewarded as it should be. That's an important insight, and I'm sure that uh, I think you're right. I think you're onto something very important. I don't know that students that I deal with can often deal with rejection very well. And I do think they're grade driven. And one of the things that we try to impress upon young people, at least in my classes, is that it's about what you're learning and taking away, not necessarily the grade that you acquire. But grades continue to be an important part of students' lives today. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not, but I appreciate your perspective. Um, your title of your book is interesting. The subtitle, How I Turned Dyslexia, ADHD, and 100 Square, foot, uh, into 100 square Feet into a Company Called Kinko's. Um, can you tell us how you turned your learning challenges into learning opportunities? Yeah, I'm lucky to have these qualities. I got four of them. I've got four great qualities. Are you impressed? <laughs> First is I'm a horrible reader. 
I cheated in my alphabet test with Sister Sheila, and I had six weeks to go, and she found out I didn't know the alphabet. And you should have seen her face. I flunked second grade, and all I remember is Sister Sheila paddling the hell out of me. <laughs> then, in third grade, I had to go to Hollywood, and this lady, Dr. Paul, there were eight kids in the class. Two were 18 years old. I'm nine, and I kept thinking, now, this seems a little odd for me in school with 19 year olds. <laughs> but evidently, if you have severe learning, like out of the birth canal issues, you can't raise your head. And I was in the backyard, and I said, oh, look at that airplane. I was nine years old, and they couldn't raise their head. And I thought, why am I in school like this? So I uh, didn't belong there. Then I went to a memory school in Crenshaw. Then I went to an eye doctor three days a week, and they'd look at stupid little eye circles and dilate my eyes. And then I finally found Dr. Her and Dr. Kaywood, and they found it, taught me how to read. And my parents said, every word I ever read cost them $50. <laughs> and I was expelled from John Burroughs Junior High in LA. Anybody know John Burroughs Junior High? I was expelled. And the vice principal told my mother, Oh, maybe Mrs. Orfala, if Paul really applies himself, he can learn to lay carpet. And I, my mother said, I just think he can do more than lay carpet. But I graduated from high school, eighth and bottom of my class at 1,200. So that's an advantage. Second advantage is I have no mechanical ability whatsoever. I don't know how to fix a thing. I don't have computers. I don't know how to do stick shift. And uh, why was that an advantage? Because when I bought these Xerox machines, I didn't want to buy a machine. I, wanted, I knew I could sell what came at the end. I mean, was, wasn't that an advantage, not knowing how to run a machine and just saying I could sell what comes out of it? Think about it. Wasn't I buying copies, not copiers? And so I was lucky to have that perspective. Then uh, my other advantage is I'm extremely restless. They call it ADD, but I just get bored easily. And uh, why was that an advantage? Because my job at Kinko's was going store to store to store looking for what people are doing right. Can I make a lot more money looking and discovering an idea or somebody doing something right or hovering in that office about the bottom 10%? Now, if you manage to the bottom 10%, aren't you always going to be wor uh, overmanaging? But I always wanted to understand why the top 10% were so successful, and I figured I could always deal with the bottom 10%. And no matter what you do, you're always going to have the bottom 10%. So uh, let me ask y'all a question. I'm not getting paid, so you just got to do one thing for me. Put up your hands if I ask you this really difficult question. Can you handle it? Please. How many of you could work or go to school an hour a day? Put your hand up. Don't have to check other people. This is not a complicated, this is really simple. Keep your hands up, please. How many can you work five hours a day? Eight hours a day? 12, 14, 16, 18? 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Okay, 20, 22. Okay, what's interesting is your savings works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doesn't it? I mean, you put money in the bank and they pay you so much, you don't do anything, you just go to sleep and it's more interest, isn't it? Uh, and your ideas work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, don't they? For an example, in San Diego, we, were, I, we had these people doing calendars. You ever see one of our calendars? You take 12 little pictures and you put them on a calendar. We sold them for like $29. I think they cost us no more than a dollar. Was that a cool idea? <laughs> now, could I have, would, if I didn't go to work for two years, could I have made bet more money just discovering that one idea or hovering in that office? An idea is waking a lot of money. So uh, I think you should maybe, uh, in addition to, you want my advice for everybody? Take an hour a day of being stupid. Don't be productive an hour a day, any day of the finals week, anything. Just take an hour to yourself, wander, take a walk and think. Hey, wow, what's really going on there? What did I learn today that kind of applies to the real world? Just don't be so serious an hour a day. I was lucky. I couldn't take things too seriously, so I was always, wonder, always wa wa wandering and wondering. See, I was never capable enough.
to do things competently. I can't write a letter, can't fix a machine. Isn't my motto, anybody else can do it better? Are I correct? Am I capable to do th too many things in this planet Earth competently? No. But you indicate in your book that your dyslexia and dyslexics typically have greater empathy for people. Did that, did that influence the way you treated people that you worked with and your partners and employees at Kinko's? I think, I don't think unless you have empathy, you can understand where your customers are going. You only really do three things in business. It's very simple. Don't make it too complicated. If you're not motivating your workers, understanding your customers, or balancing your checkbook, that's all you do. So uh, to understand your customers, you, gotta really, you have to be empathetic to understand what the hell are they, what are they, what are they really asking for? What are they, and your workers, they, my whole business, I sold this business to these bozos in New York. <laughs> and I, we went to dinner one night, and they asked me my biggest competitive advantage in our old business, Kinko's. And I said, well, you know, it's a spark on our workers' eyes. And they all looked at each other like typical Harvard and this type elitist school types. Well, who's this bozo? I mean, but it really was the only advantage I had in business. It was a spark in my workers' eyes, wasn't it? So, uh, but you tell that to the elitists of the world, they'll look at you like, earthy people, workers. <laughs> Do you want my other, I want another one about these elitist? <laughs> I was always in school with the, like, extra credit people, like, uh, the, you know, there's the, the, the uh, extra, you know, the remedial people, and I was always down here, and all these, uh, what do they call those, uh, students? Gate students, Gates or, or, the, or whatever. The, the better reading groups and all that. They were always in this little group. So as I go on in my academics, I'm always with the people here. And all these elitists go to their little high schools, their elitist colleges. And I'm always here with these people. And I always thought these people were idiots that were so disconnected from the real people. And I think there's an arrogance to elitism in education. They, they don't know what it's like to be a real human being and what their struggles are. So I was always lucky, because I was maybe with the, um, I would call them more re real, maybe just the real people that have a rough time making a living. That's a, a very interesting perspective. Paul, I'm just wondering, um, you, you start in 1970, you smart, start in this 100 square foot spot in IV. Was there a moment in time when you realized that you were on the verge of building a multi-billion dollar business? I mean, was there that kind of epiphany? No, that? only when I cashed the check and I sold the <laughs> business. No, I was never had allowed myself to be confident. I cashed the check. We bought this expensive TV cabinet once, my wife and I. And I was very aggravated every time I looked at this cabinet. And I cashed the check, and it's the first time I ever felt like I owned anything. You know what I mean? You owe so much money to the banks and all of that. No. I don't, unless you get financial security, you can't take yourself secure. You know, you can't take yourself too seriously. Then I finally got a little bit of, but if you're in business and you don't think somebody's gonna wipe you out in the heartbeat, you got problems. There was always somebody to wipe me out. And they didn't have a, they didn't care two hoots or a damn about me and my family. They would just like to step on me. Isn't that true in business? You know what Ray Kroc said about competition? If they were drowning, I'd put a hose in their mouth. <laughs> What's true? I mean, it's, it sounds cruel, but it is. Somebody is out to take, your, take it from you. And I was always across the street from somebody that wanted to wipe me out. Was and you it, know, you can't imagine. I was raised in an environment. My dad made women's clothes. And you can't imagine a more cutthroat business than manufacturing women's clothes. And I remember one time we had this really cool style. It was called a picket fence. My dad had this dress. And within two weeks, they knocked it off. They were able to do it and took out his advantage. He was so elated about the picket fence, and then he was all depressed because they took it away from him. But it's really like that in the garment business. So we, we read a lot in uh, academic textbooks today about the importance of establishing a vision. Did you have a vision in 1970 of what you wanted to, this to become? I always told everybody I worked with. 
my big goal was just to be financially solvent. I just always wanted to pay my bills and never let my uh, dreams go ahead of my cash. And uh, I was, that's the part I enjoyed the most, actually, managing the cash. I really did. I would always think of cash flows and I was going to pay my bills. It keep me up a lot, but I enjoyed it. Very interesting. We were a private business. And uh, that was enjoyable. Um, I'm, I'm, I hope they don't think I'm too cutthroat and empathetic. I told you I'm empathetic, but I, I didn't like my competition. I don't blame you. Um, I, I'm almost hesitant to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I, I'm curious to know what you think we should be teaching young people who want to be entrepreneurs. And do you think we can teach students to become successful entrepreneurs? I tell you the thing I think you can learn. I was thinking about this sailing teaches you so much intuition. You know, you have to figure out the wind, you know, when your sails are set right. I don't know if something subtle like being out there all by yourself in the ocean can teach you uh, intuition. But uh, can you teach? I think a person who wants to register in the class is already pre-sold in being an entrepreneur, aren't they? That's half the battle. Can you teach somebody to walk down the street and keep their eyes open and say, you know, there's a successful business over there. What are they doing right? Uh, I think perhaps most people are too busy to keep their eyes open. So maybe to teach entrepreneurship, people should just have a little more idle time and be co comfortable with your anxiety. Aren't you basically intrinsically, at your age, shouldn't you be just basically miserable? You don't know where your next meal is coming from? <laughs> is that fair to say? Just be truthful. I, I, I am suffering. I don't know where my next meal is coming from. But rather than dealing with my career, I'm just going to be busy. Isn't that a good cop-out to say, well, rather than my anxieties, I'm just going to submerge myself in busy, busy, busy behavior. Is that fair to say? Isn't it the hour that you're being dumb, the time that life comes up to you and says, yeah, things are a little nervous. So we should maybe be teaching students to become better observers? Yes. And, and what kinds of things do you pay attention to? Oh, I look at everything. I live with my eyes. I'll notice, uh, I like looking at the, I used to go with my father, and we would go to shops, and we'd just look from the front door, and he'd call it window shopping. And I just learned to observe businesses from the front door. We observe the lighting, the way they merchandise, how they do their windows. Very important. Very important. Most people are too busy. I'll give you an example of busyness. In our business, how many of you have been patrons of Kinko's? Okay. What are you, I'm going to say that you're probably, when you go inside of Kinko's, uptight and confused. You don't know what you want and you want it yesterday. Are you really like, oh, let's go have a peaceful moment and go to Kinko's? Never. Uh, <laughs> So if you're dealing with people that are uptight and agitated, do you think I'm going to have everything disheveled in the store? I'm going to have people dressed in uh, all sorts of uh, weird outfits? We finally figured out, after being in the business seven, eight years, that if we dress nicely, look like a Republican, uh, <laughs> people will treat us a little better. So, uh, uh, but I would take all the people I worked with to the front door, and I'd say, now what is going on in this business? What's your sense of balance? The customer wants a sense of proportion, a sense of evenness, not too many high objects, a sense of neatness. Isn't that right? You're dealing with uptight people. Don't you want, don't, would you send a conflicted message? We're going to do the colors in yellow and red and make you all agitated? <laughs> calm, calm. So I'd take the, our people to the front door and I'd say, what's your sense of balance? Then I would take the same people to the cash register and I'd look out. Inevitably, the best sense of balance was at the cash register looking out. We didn't look as our customers. And people are too busy. They go to work every day in a video. They don't see it. I walk in once a while, I see the still picture. Here I have a half a million dollars in machines in these stores. 
and it, there's a telephone here, and they put post-it notes with all these obscene colors on it. And what are your eyes going to see? You're not going to look at the beautiful Xerox machines and all that wonderful stuff I want you to look at. You're going to look at that phone and all that obscenity of phone, of what do they call those, post-it note colors? Right. They don't see it, but you've got to remind them, look at, look as your customers. Um, I want, I'm going to kind of ask you a favor. Uh, when I go into class each day, I ask my students typically at the start of class, what's going on in the world? And I'm not complaining because a lot of my students are here, but they really don't have too much to say. So I would like for you, if you would, to do me a favor and tell them the importance of being curious and paying attention to what's going on today. Well, uh, it's astounding the lack of knowledge of current events. I teach at USC in my own class. I'll give them a little current events test in the beginning. Two students this last, some last few weeks ago, they were 2,200 in the SAT types, solid A's. Native Californians couldn't point Arizona on the map. <laughs> the guy said, oh, it's sort of in this area. How do you not know where Arizona is? <laughs> do you think that if you didn't know where Arizona was, you might have had that straight A education, but you got in the lunchroom and they're going to say, fired? What do you think? I mean, there's just certain things. How many of you knew last summer there was a flood in Pakistan? What are you going to talk about when you get out in the real world if you don't have any knowledge of current events? How do you have any way of assimilating your education in some sort of context if you don't have a knowledge of current events? I was always a current, current events junkie. I'd go home at 4 o'clock and watch news till 7. Maybe I took it to the extreme. But I wake up in the middle of the night and I watch the BBC for five minutes to find out what the hell's gone on since I went to bed. I'm really curious. <laughs> you ever watch, read a good book, you just can't wait for the next chapter? It never happened to me, but I hear you can do it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the news is like that. So you heard it from Mr. Orfila himself, my students. Be curious, pay attention. And watch the paper, read the paper, read the news, be involved. Thank you. I'm sure that goes a lot further than my words of encouragement, so thank you for the favor, Paul. Um, in your book, uh, there's a statement you make that you say, every setback is a step in the right direction. I'm just wondering what you mean by that, and, and what are your thoughts on failure in general? It's just, unfortunately, you have to live with it, don't you? It'd be nice to, it would be nice if I had, but, I would so just, but you know what, at the end of the day, here I am, I got my own business. Every miserable thing in that business came to my attention. If they, if they didn't tell me about it, I was out looking for it. I walked down the hall and I'd see stuff that aggravated me. So if, after going to work for eight hours, seven hours, I'm just finding stuff that aggravates me. And at the end of the day, I go home seething from this aggravation. I say to myself, did these people go to work just to aggravate me today with stupidity? <laughs> I mean, you just can't believe some of the stuff. If you're not vigilant on top of your business, people will do. And you know, I'm the owner. And what's weird is I was always, there's a difference between the CEO and the owner. The owner is across the street saying, are you viable? I was the only guy that didn't feel like they were seduced by that business. I never was seduced by it. I was always paranoid. I was always thinking, somebody's going to come and wipe me out. And they were. You know what? Somebody did come and I started being aware of it and uh, I sold my business. I kept looking at the laser printer thinking, you know, they're not across the street, this laser printer, but it's going to come in from left field and wipe me out. And it sort of did wipe out Kinko's, the laser printer. Why do you go to a copier anymore? And that was the mother load of our business. But I could see it coming. I just felt it coming. You know, I knew it in my stomach. It was time to get out of Dodge. And I think I was, I think I was correct. Maybe. But you've got you to gotta know when to sell. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul, I think... Um and it's certainly probably true of me as well, maybe everyone here. We look at you, you're Paul Orfalo, you're the founder of Kinko's, a very, very successful company. And, and I think many people might assume that you never failed. And so I'm just wondering, is, is success dependent upon failing sometimes? In, 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 in well, since I had 50 years, until I was 50, I just felt like, man, it was just, I didn't, I don't know. I, the happiest day of my life, I cashed that check and felt safe. I don't know. And you know what's funny is everybody goes to work with you and they think, oh, you're a big business. You're so successful. 
And I'm saying to myself, all these people are so secure, how come I'm so miserable here? Uh, no, if you're, you're not paranoid, I think you got a problem in business. They are. If you don't walk away thinking, you got to rethink your business, rethink, rethink, wander, understand why, repraise constantly. The problem with me is I didn't have enough people aggravated in my business. I, I understand that. I think I, that's, an, that's just a normal part of the process of operating a business, I think. It's, no, 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 everybody's, they get seduced, they go to the Easter Seal meeting, they go to the country club and they're all fancy and I never had that luxury. No, and I was always, and you know, there's three parts of your life to be successful. There's work, love, and play. And I had, you know, you let your career dominate your life. You get dysfunctional in other areas. So I was lucky enough to be married to my wife, Natalie, that wouldn't allow me to be dysfunctional in these other areas. But it's very important. Absolutely. Do you think it's possible in, in this current environment that we're in that there, that these young people can dream and think about starting a business and being successful? Or is that kind of? It's more now than ever. When I graduated in business school, my parents, in 1959, the marginal tax rates in this country were 91%. So John Kennedy gets elected, he takes them to 70%. I graduated from business school, the tax rate in this country was 70%. And then Reagan took it to 28, and now we've got it back up to about 40 with the state of California. Uh, no, I, I think so many opportunities. How many of you have been to Berkeley? Have you ever seen Top Dog? What did you notice about Top Dog? Customers online? Every time you see somebody in line, ask, why are they in line? Why is that successful? What is it about Joe's? You know, Joe's has a lot of people packed in there. What is it? Thick drinks? What are they doing right? Is it old? Is it a habit? Or Understand it. Always understand. And then what always aggravated me about our executives, or people I would work with, I'd say, well, tell me about the competition. And they'd say, oh, it's terrible. Nobody likes them. Everybody hates them. And I'd say the mere fact that they have one customer means they're doing something right. Can you tell me what they're doing right? What can you learn from that guy? But everybody, I don't know, I just found a lot of contentment. Do I look like a content person now? Mellow, easygoing. People on weekends and after work would say, God, does he ever get excited? And then people at work looked at me as a chihuahua. Is that fair to say? <laughs> How does this man relax? I never, on weekends, I never did anything that aggravated me. I was always relaxed. Uh, Paul, I read something in your book. Again, so many things touched me and uh, Laurel. Kind of tell me a little bit that what I'm sharing with my students is maybe on point. Uh, you say the following, uh, trusting people is very emancipating. If you don't, you ought to give it a try. You will find your life will be better and be much more fun if you do. Without trust, You'll be forever miserable in marriage or friendship. And in business, nothing you plan will work well if you don't extend trust to the people you do business with. As a leader, all you do is manage trust. Can you tell us tonight how you manage trust in your organization? I'm going to maybe in my, I'm going to give you a separate anecdote. I just came back from Russia and uh, the Black Sea with uh, world leaders. It was some world leaders. It was Gorbachev, Condoleezza Rice, all those. Every country I went to, I went to six, Russia, Azerbaijan, all these countries. In every country I went to, every leader said, what we need in our society is an independent judiciary. They didn't trust their judges. They were afraid of their police force. In this country, we take for granted, we just have basic fairness. And what built this country was a handshake, people's sense of integrity. I don't think we realize that we stop at red lights we go on green lights. We have driving codes. In Russia, these oligarchs park wherever they want because they have money and that nobody's punitive. You can't believe how wonderful this country is with trusting relationships. And the only thing you have is trust. What is the biggest, most important thing a child wants? A predictable environment from their mother. That's called trust. What's the only thing you want from a, a teenager? Trust. What's the only thing you want from a, a worker? Trust. Isn't that, isn't, doesn't a worker say, well, I want to be trusted that you can pay me? Trust is all the qualities of leadership.
Isn't that when you break someone's trust? Isn't that life's all about trust? There's only one word. word. And so uh, I had no choice, as much as I'm paranoid. Was, uh, I had to trust people. I trusted people because I wasn't capable to do things myself. And so did that trust show itself in the culture of your company, in the manner in which you uh, interacted with people? How did it show itself? I don't know if Karen will agree, but I'm not too sure. I've been thinking about this culture. I think all boats float on a rising tide. We were making good money. And I'm not, I think we had a good culture, but I also think there was some money in that checkbook. Uh, we had great values, but could it have survived this downturn? Or the fact that people weren't coming to us in the first place? Uh, we had a great culture, a great attitude. I'm, I'm, I don't know. When money's in the checkbook, everybody sort of likes you. Is that true? I think that's probably a true statement, yes. We had money in the checkbook, so they liked us. I, I'm not totally convinced. The fact is I never mounted a check. I paid my bills. I, honored, I shook my hands. I met my commitments. But I imagine shaking someone's hands and bouncing a check. I mean, that's, how, how fast would I destroy my reputation and my business? No, I couldn't do that. So did you earn people's trust by first giving them trust? Yes, 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 yes. See, if you know me by now, did you do you think... I enjoyed being in a Kinko store. I hated it. I couldn't wait to leave the stores. Is that right? Now, you have two ways of treating a worker when you leave. You ever had a job with someone did this to you? What would you do back? You hit them 10 times harder. Is that right? Now, if I'd like to leave the store and I want to go like this to the hand ringing my register, do you think I'm going to get really good results? Let's try it again. I'm going to go like this to the hand that rings my register. Right? Do you get the idea? Happy fingers ring happy registers. <laughs> and what better way do you tell somebody you trust them than leave the store? <laughs> I mean, I trust you. I'm leaving. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll leave. And I found in our business, the farther away a supervisor lived from the store, the better the store did. In other words, the less supervision, the better they did. Because what happens when the supervisor goes in, they destroy the trust the manager has with their people. And I never would go to the stores unannounced because I th thought that that wouldn't show respect to the managers. I was always uh, very aware that it was about trusting relationships. And uh, I thank you for sharing that, Paul. It means a lot. It looks like we have our first question from Ronnie. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I was just wondering, I think some of the students might be curious, uh, what was uh, your favorite memory of Isla Vista? <laughs> the funniest? Uh, just favorite. That you're willing to tell. <laughs> <laughs> favorite story of Isla Vista? Happiest. <laughs> There's so many funny moments. I remember just sitting at the counter sometimes, and I would just joke with the customers. And back then, everybody was anti-war. I don't know if you think this is funny. So they're all upset with the war in Vietnam. And I'd say, you know, see these real radicals are all protesting this, that, and the other. And there's Xerox and how to make Molotov cocktails and all this. So I'd get some of these real radical guys, and I'd say, oh, hey, dude. Why are you guys against napalm? They look at me like, what do you mean? Napalm's a horrible bomb, a horrible bomb, a horrible bomb. I'd say, you know, I can, I'm kind of against the war in Vietnam, but why? Napalm's kind of cool because my dad owns a napalm factory. <laughs> and before the war, we just eat a bunch of beans and rice. Or there was this Hispanic guy, who didn't speak very good English, so I give him his paycheck. He goes, Mira, what's the FICA? You know, the F I C A at the back. Yeah. So he says, I go, yeah, it's George Fika. He just bought a Cadillac, and we're taking a collection for him. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, stuff like that. <laughs> it was funny. I mean, it, it, I don't know. There's some funny, a lot of funny moments. 
That's a, that's a great story. Thank you. <laughs> Looks like we have another young man that might have asked. Thank you, Bill. Um, how did you uh, motivate your workers each and every day? Why did they want to come to work oh, each and every day? It wasn't me. I figured it out from the very beginning. It wasn't me. And I can leave this business very successful. Because a, a customer walks in, they don't know what the hell they want. They want it yesterday. They're kind of a senior person in society, maybe a school teacher, bank president. They walk to a high school kid or a junior person in society, and the senior person says, you know, they have a conversation. How will my presentation look better? What can I do to make it look better, look better? So the person feels like, you know, I'm inputting something important here. The worker sees the manufacturing process and gets the thank you from the customer. That was motivating. More importantly, the work we did contributed to society. Uh, you could see the connection of helping people get jobs. You could see the connection of having a salesperson get a sale. Or in Spokane, Washington, there was a little girl that was abducted or kidnapped. And the family went to the police force first, they went to us second. Those are powerful connections to contributing to society. How many of you have ever seen that uh, ad with the baby in the tire? Did you ever see that ad? Michelin ad? Michelin ad? You're too young. You didn't watch football. Um, you never saw the ad? There was this baby riding in a tire, and they're trying to say, if you make better tires, the babies will be safer, right? Wasn't that ad also at the workers at Michelin and say, you know, if I make a better product, I might save somebody's life. What you got to remember is everybody wants to go to work every day to think that they're contributing to society. They don't want to say, I'm just doing something selfish and just aggrandizing. They want to say, this is a contribution. And we, it, our business, could definitely feel we're contributing to society. So uh, they were self-motivated. And, and my wife told me the best quote. Management is to remove obstacles. The only reason you have a boss is to make your life simpler, not harder. So uh, does it make sense for a boss to say, oh, let's go out and burden these workers so they can be more unproductive? I mean, that's their whole job. Is that... So my job was to really run interference with the counter workers. Thanks. Was that part of the reason why you referred to everyone in Kinko's as a coworker? I didn't like the word. You know, the word employee means it comes from a steel mill. You employ steel. I didn't like that. And I, I think the word staff means like you got an infection. Uh, <laughs> Do you think that, uh, that most of the opportunity that's out there today is going to be techno technology related? No. No. Most? Maybe a lot, but I think people got to eat. There'll always be a bathroom for paper, won't there? I mean, people were, I mean, people are going to take a computer to the bathroom. There'll always be a market for uh, shelter, clothing. If you look at how consumers are 65% of the economy, its basic needs are uh, met by uh, food, shelter, and clothing, entertainment. You're not going to go to movies. You're going to drive your car. You're going to... There's so many other expenditures besides computers and technology. That... You strike me as a very tactile individual that likes to deal with people. It seems to me like technology is taking us away from those partnerships that you refer to in life. Uh, am I, is I, that just, I get so baffled how somebody could sit in front of that stupid TV screen for eight hours a day. Like, that's reality. Uh, I just, I don't understand how you can sit there and just look at this nonsense screen all the time as if it's something, I don't, I don't understand it. So Why don't you walk down? And then these people in school, they got the earplugs with the music. Why don't you just walk and try to have a conversation and observe? Uh, life is there with the outside planet, not that silly screen. It's a supplement. I, I don't, you know, I made a lot of money. I made money from computers, but I never liked them. I don't like, I don't know how to type. Why would I want a computer? <laughs> I've never done an email. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't like phone calls either. Um. Shifting gears just a little bit. Um, 
I'm just real curious uh, for a person who's been very successful in their life and built a very successful business and has a wonderful family and all. And that's, did you ever ask yourself though, in your business, why you, yes. why you were able to build? I go down this fancy house I have, and I look down, I go down the stairs and I said, me? How did, how did I get all this? I, I always baffled at this. I'm not supposed to be the one that's successful. All my friends, they all studied, studied, studied. I'm always, you know, not looking like I'm studying very hard, never write notebooks. They look at me like, wait, I did everything right. I did it by the system. How do you get it, Paul? You, there's no reason. You shouldn't have any of this stuff. How did you do this? And there was a little, uh, it doesn't seem fair. I never worked past five. I never worked on weekends. And it just seems chicken shit to most people. Doesn't it seem chicken? I didn't seem like I burned the midnight oil. I was worrying constantly. Uh, staying up all night worrying. Uh, a lot of mental work. But uh, it just doesn't seem fair, does it? Well, no, I don't know if it doesn't seem fair. It, it seems unusual. Um, were you just in the right place at the right time? Yeah. Luck. That has a lot to do with it. I think in the first location, I didn't know Pardal was the main traffic pattern of Isla Vista. And I found this little place for $100 a month. I had no idea it was the main artery. It was just serendipitous. I look at a lot of things that happened. It was just serendipitous. Uh, if I chose the wrong location, I don't think I would have stayed in business. Uh, no, no. I, I was, a lot of life is luck. Mm -hmm. I, th yeah. Uh, you strike me that based on your experience... Not a lot. It's most, uh, some of life is luck. Yeah, I think so. I think we have to have a little luck every once in a while. I'm still waiting for mine, by the way. So, <laughs> It seems to me like, based on your experience with your family, that you learned the value of saving. And I'm just wondering, are, are, you, a, are you a numbers guy? Yeah, I love it. Was that your strength within your business as well? Well, uh, my mom didn't... wasn't didn't care about school that much because I was a bad student. And she never harassed her kids to go to anything about school. But she always said about college, does not look like fun. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you go to college for fun. It's kind of cool, isn't it? You just, uh, but my mom only cared about two things, sleeping and saving. And if you weren't in bed at 9, 9.30 and get a good night's sleep, you weren't taking advantage of your education. Everything was about sleep. <laughs> savings. Now, I got to tell you, you only have two ways of doing life successfully. You better do it the school thing, get those straight A's and be a lawyer, a doctor, one of those things, teacher, or you better do it with your savings, but you better be good at one or the other. Because if you're half-ass at school and half-ass at saving your money, you're going to be half-ass like a victim in life. You better know what you're doing with your money. Save your money. And my grandmother would say, her children. The first thousand is the hardest to save. And I'd say maybe now the first ten thousand dollars is the hardest to save. But then you have ten thousand dollars. Somebody says something, you say, "Oh, yeah, it's an opportunity." And then you start making money and your money, and you make money and your money. But it is hard to save the first bit and get against the addiction of spending. Don't you notice? Don't you have this idea that the big banks and all these big people just can't wait to suck you, suck every ounce of energy out of you with these horrible bank <laughs> interest rates, credit card debt, the, you have to have the Rolex watch, the fancy car, all that nonsense. Uh, they just want to, uh, it's terrible not to have financial discipline. So uh, I, was always, I was always a real saver all my life. Very miserly, stingy. Thank you, Paul. It looks like we have another question up here. Hey, Paul, my name is Nicholas. Um, I just wanted to know, like, what were your, some of your first business obstacles that you talk about as far as, um, you know, making it easier for just your company? Biggest obstacles were myself. We have a young lady over Hi, here. Um, can you tell us uh, what did you uh, develop, how did you develop your uh, skill when you were in college and what the most uh, valuable thing you think you got from USC or your USC experience? Thank you. Well, I didn't take notes. 
<laughs> and uh, I listened. I loved accounting. I loved. I didn't do well in school till I took accounting. I loved it. I loved all my business school classes except the goofy math. You know, the X's and Y, and yeah, that kind of nonsense. But I loved every class. I'd sit there and I'd just be entertained. And I knew I was going to have my own business. And it just, I could figure out. I knew how to apply it. I heard those lectures and I'd say, well, I'm going to use that one day. I, it just, you know, one of the bad things in your education is you take notes. When I teach school, I don't let my take, students take notes. Because what the problem with taking notes is you don't daydream with knowledge. You're always so busy scribbling. You never get a chance to say, what was that person really talking about here? Like, and how can I really use this? But I didn't go to school for grades. I would just, I know I was going to have my own business. And obviously, I couldn't get good grades. So uh, I just went for C's and D's. But I learned. I really did learn. If I bothered <laughs> learning it, I remembered it and I used it. And I'm very innately curious. So I, how I got through college was the biggest challenge of my life. I am no more to this day than a third grade speller. I can look at the words repeatedly. I won't know how to spell it the next time. I really can't. I don't have any capabilities in it. It's like, a, I'm not good at it. I just don't have any. And how do you get through college without spelling? And it's not, and I'm finally angry at this damn language. I really am. What does S-E-W spell? Do you all know? Does that make any sense whatsoever? <laughs> Don't I have a right to be so upset with this horrible language and say, why would you do this? Why would you make S-E-W so? But you look at G-H, and that's an F. Why? Who? Why did you just, did you just invent this language and spelling to torment me? <laughs> Thank so you. I'm not, it's not my fault. Thank you for your question. We have another one. one class about achieving your childhood dream. So I was wondering, what was your childhood dream? And has Kinko's helped you achieve it? Or was Kinko's part of your childhood dream? My childhood dream was to have my own business all my life. And the reason I didn't, I said, well, you know, I'm not going to know how to read. I don't care. I'll have, a, I'll have a, an assistant to read to me. So uh, I sort of had that happen. Uh, but I wanted to have my own business. And I really wanted, I wanted it all my life. I just knew I wanted to have a big, I wanted a business. And I'm Lebanese. Do you know anybody Lebanese besides Karen? No. Do you know anybody that's Lebanese that has a job? No one. Do you have your own business? You don't work for other people. Uh, I just was never raised to have a job. It was just not in the equation. My mother would say, oh, look at those people next door. He has a job. He couldn't wait to buy the boat, get himself in debt and had no savings. He, he loses his job, he's lost everything. Uh, where we were always concerned about, you know, have your own business, have some savings. How many people would stay in a miserable job where somebody mistreats you because you didn't have any savings to fall back on? And that hell on earth. I'm gonna tell you, savings gives you dignity, gives you pride, and you have a lot of options when you have a savings account. So all of you that, uh, Want to go out and spend some money tonight on a few cocktails? Maybe save it. Thank you, Paul. We have another young lady over here who would like to ask you a question. Hello. First, thank you so much for coming to kind of share your wisdoms with us. Um, but I was really curious about the Orphala Foundation. And I understand from Melissa that you guys do some pretty awesome things and fund some pretty awesome projects. So I was wondering kind of what that aspect of your business means to you and how you feel philanthropy should be kind of um, intersected with business and people doing their business right. in their lives. When I was in business, I never gave a penny to charity. Mm -hmm. uh, we had daycare. We had a program for our coworkers, kids to get college education. It was kind of a cool deal. You got the tax deduction going in, and the kids got tax deductible money out. Mm -hmm. uh, we had every time we had more money, would increase the uh, health benefits. Uh, we had a program to help our coworkers get a down payment on their home. Now, my father had a business. I know that you probably heard mama and dada first. Mm -hmm. I heard that one. And then the only other word, I, the constant word in my family was, you know, honey, it's deductible. <laughs> Everything was a deductible. So 
at the end of the year, the tax man would come and say, well, I'm going to take 70% of your profits or 50% of your profits. And my dad would spend it. And I always figured, you know, they used to think we were fantastic at work because we had a $2 free lunch on Fridays. Now let's do the math. I spent $2 on the lunch. If I was to pay a worker $2 to buy their own lunch, it would cost me $3 because the government has the social security withholding. They have the income tax and all this kind of like whatever they take, they take a lot. And so if I save $2, my income tax rate, I might get a buck and a half out of it. Now, why wouldn't I pay a dollar and a half as opposed to my workers paying $3 for the same lunch? Why would I pass up the deduction? There's two kinds of people, people who capitalize and people who deduct. I was a deductor. So uh, you're asking, your question was what again? Oh, that was my, my theory. Every extra dollar I had, when I think of all the single mothers, I met a, little, a woman in San Antonio, a single mother, and I kept thinking, how in the hell does she do this? We pay her next to nothing. How does she buy shoes, have a car, have any semblance of sanity? And I kind of got committed to uh, single mothers in our business. I like single parents, single mother and fathers particularly. I don't see how they have any semblance of sanity. So that was my view on work. Then after I made some money, uh, I just didn't think it was, what do I need an extra? I don't like all this materialism. I'm not that. So I really wanted it. I didn't feel good about, what am I going to do? Uh, be buried with them? I don't, so I could do some good with the money along the way. So we just set up the foundation. In fact, I don't think we spend money f as fast as we could for the good needs in society. Uh, I'm very proud of Lois. Start, had a lecture from some woman at the Montecito Union, and you started the food initiative. We're trying to reform all the way people eat in the, in the schools in the county. We really believe that children shouldn't be studying so hard at preschool. They should be outside playing in the grass. We have tried to get... <laughs> Yeah, this horrible Bush and Ted Kennedy got together and screwed up education with all this analyzation in kindergarten and uh, preschool. What? We have the school gardens. Good job. Ramses, Zeus. Uh, uh, we're trying to promote... Well, tell them about it. Yeah, we're from the center. There's some more of us here, too. I mean, we're just connecting kids to their environment and, you know, food through gardens. That's a really awesome project and we're very grateful to you. It's, it's super fun. And you should talk about sharecropping. Yes, you wanna make a lot of money? <laughs> I swear to God, there's so much dirt in that Montecito all around town that you wanna to go to, a, it's been around since prior to crash, Christ sharecropping. It's not a new business. Go in and split the profits with the land order. And you make a bunch of carrots, or you go to uh, my cousin Mark Orfala owns Freebirds. He will buy 100,000 ounces, pounds of tomatoes a year. Just get a garden, grow a bunch of tomatoes. You've got a captive audience in Mark, organic tomatoes. You can make a lot of money just being a farmer and sharecropping. This is wonderful dirt here, and uh, you can make a lot of money. What's the other thing we do? Uh, a worm prepare disaster. You tell them. You could. We do disaster preparedness. This this county is so ill prepared for disasters uh, that we have made a difference in the prepare. Is that fair to say? We help. You know the government union and the workers. So this is this five million dollars set aside by the county. I don't care if I make enemies. Uh, so the government says, all the workers in the union say, oh, we're having a rough time. We need to spend the money on the, all the workers. It was set aside to build a disaster area up there. You know, the disaster emergency thing. So it was a big scandal here in Santa Barbara. How can you spend that $5 million they had already set aside for a disaster preparedness? Isn't that what you're supposed to have government services for? So we, put, we and other funders help fund this construction of a disaster Emergency Operations Center. 
I mean, it isn't like you can't look outside and think like, oh yeah, there could be a disaster, like a fire, a tsunami, an earthquake. They could close the roads. How many roads do we have in the Santa Barbara? Do you think we are prone to a disaster? Let's try this one again. Yeah, I think we are. Uh, <laughs> so that was a funny fight. We finally got a 5-0 from the supervisors to vote for it. Uh, uh, what else? Scholarships? Oh, this is a good deal. I like this one. We take kids. I'm not for the bad news kids that are bad news. That's not going to get any of my money. Re remediating troubled kids. I just don't, that's not my cause. But kids that want to help themselves that are out there, they want to go to college, they're economically uh, having not an enriched life. We take them to Montana and they go outside and they have a four week, three and a half week outside experience. It comes back and they have changed their life. But uh, if you came to me and said, well, there's this um, impoverished kids that have, they're in jail and remediation, that's not my cause. My cause is to help children that want to better themselves get better. Uh, and I really believe in an ounce of prevention with a pound of cure. If we can remediate, or like in the hospital over here, I wouldn't give them money unless they change their uh, lactation policy. And so, you know what happens in the hospital is the nurses want to give the baby a bottle in this horrible formula, right? But really, breastfeeding is like is so important for children. And, and for an example, remediation of reading issues when you start tracking with the uh, eyes and breastfeeding it helps with reading uh, breast milk if you express the milk and you a baby has a cut the mother's milk is the best antiseptic earache a baby's we have to encourage more and more breastfeeding in the society and you know as wealthy as we are as a country where do all of our where does all of our money go a bunch of wealthy people the old people i'm sorry they got golf courses, elderly. They got great health care. They have wonderful restaurants. Old people have uh, casinos to go to. Everything is spent on old people in this society. And it's going to get a lot worse if you look at the Medicare budgets. Yet, a baby, a working woman gets six weeks, or a man gets six weeks off with a newborn. As wealthy as we are in a society, you can't afford more time with a newborn baby? I mean, come on. The rubber hits the road and where we treat our babies. We need to be more lactation friendly. We need more benefits for parents of single parents. And I'm sorry, the old people, I don't get it. An elderly person at 90 years old, why, and they fall and break their hip. The government will have to spend $90,000 to replace their hip. A severely Alzheimer's patient at 80 years old is so spaced out they don't know who you are. They get to go to intensive care for $3,000 a night at Cottage Hospital. Yet we don't give our single mothers any more than six weeks off. Now, you think I could get elected with that platform? Uh, <laughs> your generosity is and philanthropy is. Uh, touched a lot of people in our community, and, and we're all thankful for your kind work, Paul, for sure. We have another question over here, please. I've always enjoyed hearing Paul speak about Kinko's and his values, but I think one of the things that I also have always admired is what he's done after Kinko's. The uh, book, The Entrepreneurial Investor, I was wondering, uh, Paul, if you might share a little bit about your ideas on investment and the future ideas there? Uh, I could answer two questions. Retirement. First of all, a lot of people fail retirement because they're not as inquisitive and they haven't made planning. I didn't have a rough time retiring. I found the world very interesting. I teach school. Uh, but my theory of investing, once again, came from Natalie. A woman bought Colonel Sanders stock, you know, the Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know why she bought it? The lines were long. You know when she sold it? When the lines were short. Any woman around will tell you, I think Gap's going to have some problems, but yet these bozos of Wall Street don't see it. Oh, they're recommending Kodak. Did you ever happen to, at the same time they're recommending Kodak, look 
and see people aren't using those kind of uh, film cameras. Or if you notice that we don't have telephone lines anymore, people have cell phones. If you noticed that we don't need these like horrible telephone poles anymore, I mean, and you look around and you'll see these people baffled at stock market and they'll go, oh, what a discovery. Landline connections are down. This telephone company is going to have a rough time. Or this bozo, not this guy, this guy in town, I saw him on TV about 10 years ago. And he bought a pay telephone company. People bought his stock like crazy, but tell me, 10 years ago, was there a future in pay telephones? Would you have, I mean, who uses a pay telephone? It's all your cell phone. Everybody has one. So you just could sit around and look at these folks and go, do you, there's a, a study done that the farther away you are from Wall Street, where you reside, the better your stock market performance is. They also studied male and female investors, this man from Davis, and he concluded females make much better investors than males. A female will tend to buy something they understand. They say, well, I went to Gap, I went to Nordstrom's, and they buy something they understand. A man tends to buy a stock they have absolutely no knowledge of. Oh, I heard they have the best cure for anal rectum disease. Oh. Uh, uh, a man, if you ever noticed, a man will buy and flick the TV stations constantly. A woman will tend to watch one show, and, but a man will buy and sell stocks constantly where a woman will buy and hold. Much better strategy. A male will say, oh, that stock went up because of my superior intelligence. A woman will say, you know, I was just kind of lucky here. For those three reasons, he concluded women make much better investors. <laughs> so uh, we wrote a book on these theories we have. And once, like Johnson & Johnson, about six months, six, about five, they had a problem in their factories and they started covering it up. And Johnson & Johnson is the company with the most highest, in, highest integrity and best values. And one of my, my, probably my favorite company. When they started covering that up and lying, that's a bad thing. They just got to come out and say, you know, we're going to fix the problem. We have one last question from the audience tonight. Hi. When, how did you begin marketing when you first opened Kinko's? I worked, uh, when I first opened, I worked, uh, I was at USC, and I had my fifth year of college, so I would work Tuesdays and Thursday mornings. And I was wondering, why, are we, why is it everybody complains Tuesday and Thursday mornings? And I figured out that I was the manager, and that they were always telling, well, the, when you come back Tuesday, he'll be here to, to solve your problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, then after a few months, I hired a manager to run the whole store without me. So uh, I was able to be free. I've always defined what I did for a living is everything runs beautifully without me. I could take lots of vacations, I, which I did, and I always got perspective. But whatever I did every day, I made it better. You know what I mean? So I was always trying to make it better and not be absorbed with yesterday's work. You understand the managers, I have a long, you want me to give you a longer answer? You might get some insight out of this. When we started our business, there were three and four workers in all these stores. The leaders of those stores knew a lot about things, didn't they? Wasn't I looking for people that were unlike myself, that were, uh, knew a lot about how to fix the wires and run the machines? Now, I leave a business with 40 and 50 workers in a store. The leader of those stores knew a lot about what? People or things? They knew a lot about how to motivate people. Two kinds of people. People who know about things and people who know about people. And if you're a thing person, and you can't handle leading people, don't get yourself a nervous breakdown, it's okay. You feel more comfortable doing everything yourself. You understand, you're gonna have a nervous breakdown. We would always promote people because they knew how to run Xerox machines properly. Wrong. They have to motivate people. So uh, uh, if you're the kind of person that likes to eat their alphabet soup alphabetically, stay with things. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, 
You want to hear the other one? I got two more. One anecdote. Perfect. Go. Cool. I'm being a ham, aren't I? No, you're being wonderful. Go for it. Uh, what time is it? I was at, I always spent time in classrooms, believe it or not. When I was at school, I went to all these, when I graduated, I had my own business, I'd go to University of Virginia for a week, all these courses, always, always, always. Because it's kind of funny, when you pay your own money, you kind of learn. When your parents will pay for it, you go, oh, yeah. But I really wanted to go to learn. So I went to this school, and this guy owned these convenience markets in Pennsylvania called Sheets's Market. And you know, I like to sleep. So the guy tells an anecdote at lunch I wasn't really paying attention to, but I heard it. He said, you know, we had these convenience markets, like 7-Elevens. We would do $5,000 a day in business, but we took our little stopwatch, and from 12 to 6 in the morning, we would do maybe $60 in business, so we would close from 12 at night to 6 in the morning. Then he told me the kicker. He said, for some unexplained reason, our business would drop 50%. I never could understand it. So he says that two days later, I'm sleeping. I wake up like a bat out of hell. And I said, what did this guy tell me? If you go 24 hours a day, your daytime business doubles. Didn't that's what he said? Isn't the art of business seeing what isn't there? So I'm nagging the field to go 24 hours. Nagging, 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 nagging. I, I, you know, it would be nice if they just listened and did what I said, but they didn't. I, find, I knew if I got the experiment and somebody didn't want to do it, it wouldn't work. So I'm nagging. Finally, I get a guy from Chicago to say, try it. He gets up at a meeting and says, you know, the thing works. So everybody went 24 hours. You either listen to me or a manager. Now, the other part of that anecdote is in our company values, to be su successful in life, you have to have three things in value. Balance, work, love, and play. Can you imagine following a leader that's tired, haggard, and miserable? You go, oh, yeah, that's a really cool characteristic. I want to follow that leader. Is it the primary quality of a leader is they know how to manage themselves? So if you couldn't have a balance in your life, how could you run a 24-hour-a-day business? So we encourage people, don't work after 40 hours a week. Work with examples. Follow me, set an example. But there's no way you could run a 24-hour day business without burning yourself out, right? We burned out a lot of people that didn't acquire the leadership skills it took to run a 24-hour day business. Uh, but you got to exam... So it is okay for you to be kind to yourself. It's okay for you to think, hey, I need a little relaxation here. I've been stressed all day. Uh, my mother would always say whenever somebody was at the house and they were saying goodbye or something, she always said, you know, honey, I'm sure it's called everybody, honey, you know, you don't seem kind to yourself. I don't know why she would always tell all of her friends when they come for advice, you're not kind to yourself. How many of you are kind to yourself? So be kind to yourself. You know, uh, take some relaxation. You're working when you're not working. Your mind is always going. Try not to be too busy. Try to really reflect what's going on here. Why? What's going on? Why? You'll be more successful. I think you'll have a better life. You'll have a little more paranoia, but you'll have a little better life. Uh, and if I'm done, am I done? I have one piece of advice. One last piece of advice about success. There's only one measure of success in life. You know what that is? Your children want to be with you when they're adults. Can you imagine Christmas coming up and your kids are too busy to come home? And I used to interview people. I'd always never do it in my office because I hated my office. But I'd always take somebody to dinner, and I wanted to make sure they were a little liquored up. <laughs> because if... In wine, there is truth. <laughs> and I wanted to see how they treated waiters and waitresses. Very important. Also, I wanted to find out 
if they were kind to their parents or they were thoughtful. If they said for any dysfunctional reason they hated their parents and they would never go home for the holidays, I would X them from the list in just right away. It's not their fault that the parents, they hate their mother was an alcoholic and beat the hell out of them. I don't care. That's, I'm not going to have to work with you. To our credit, when I left the business, we had very few divorces. And uh, uh, there was something about, I don't know, being kind to your parents that really is important in life. And uh, that's the only last thought is go tell your parents they're okay. After having those screaming little maniac children, uh, you don't realize how important it is to say thank you to them. Wait till you have your own kids and they drive you out of your mind. You're going to really say thank you to your parents. Well, Paul, on behalf of Santa Barbara City College and the Scheinfeld Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, thank you kindly for coming here tonight and sharing your wonderful story and wisdom with us. Thank you very much.